day in the book of First Kings, please, could we go to the Lord in prayer? Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for this place that you provided, Lord, for your people that have gathered. Thank you, Lord, for the purpose in our gathering, and that is to preach the Word of God, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, today, if there's one that does not know you as their Savior, Lord, it's our desire that today they would see themselves as we have as sinners in need of a Savior, and Lord, by faith they would come to you. And then, Lord, if there are those today who are saved but struggling, Lord, we ask today that we would be helped and edified and built up in the faith. Lord, as we consider Elijah and his life, may we glean from that truth that will help us as we seek to pursue those things that you have purchased our souls for. Lord, that we might be fruitful for you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. First Kings, please, in chapter 17. First Kings in chapter 17. I want you to look with me, if you would, please, in verse 8. First Kings 17 and verse 8, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Let's do just a few minutes of review, could we please? Last Sunday morning we preached on the, the who Elijah is, but more than that we preached about the times uh, that Elijah was living in. Elijah is a prophet to the northern portion of Israel. Israel, the family that came from Abraham, as God promised, that eventually found themselves in Egypt. While in Egypt the family grew into a mighty nation, and after 400 some years God used a man by the name of Moses to lead them out. They went into eventually, after that generation failed to enter in, God used a man by the name of Joshua to lead them into the promised land. God gave to Israel a specific portion of ground and said from God to them, this is your land. God said, I'll bless you in that land, I'll keep you in that land. But I want you to keep your attention always on me. I don't want you to follow after false gods. I want your loyalty. I want your love. I want you to have and to understand that unique relationship that we have to each other, God said to Israel. And it will be a picture to all of the world. Unfortunately, Israel did not follow God completely in that. They did not drive out all of the inhabitants in that land. And then, after a while of being in the land, they desired to have kings uh, like those that were around them. And so God gave them a king. The first king that they had was Saul. The second king that they had was a man by the name of David. David was a warrior king. He brought peace to this place called Israel. And then David had a son. His name was Solomon. Solomon is a picture of God's grace. God used David as a warrior, and God used Solomon to give him wisdom to be a wise king. And Israel, the nation, that family that grew, developed. And under the time that Solomon was king, they became uh, uh, it. I mean, people came from all over. The, the queen from the south came to see how the folks in Solomon's kingdom behaved, how the people served, how they functioned. And there was riches, there was honor, there was recognition. And so then through that, Solomon even built a temple, the temple that God had, uh, David had on his heart that God would not allow him to build, but rather Solomon would build that temple. And the presence of God came and filled the temple in the city of Jerusalem. Well, Solomon had a son. His name was Rehoboam. Rehoboam was not as wise as his father, nor did he attain unto wise counsels. But he took the advice of his peers, and his peers said, hey, make the most of this situation that you've got. And where Solomon might have taxed a little, you tax a lot. And that's a real gen general statement there. And this young man, Rehoboam, came out and told the people, hey, if you thought my dad was tough, wait till you see how tough I am. And God split the kingdom. The nation of Israel was divided. Rehoboam took the southern portion. Jeroboam took the northern portion. In the northern portion, they would have a capital city eventually. It would be called Samaria. Jeroboam was fearful that the people in the north would go to the south to worship God at the temple. And so he did something. He committed a tremendous sin against God. It's detailed in 1 Kings chapter 14. He built two worship centers. He raised two altars with golden calves in the north because he wanted the people in the north to never travel down to Jerusalem for fear that they would unite and revolt against him. He then began to appoint anybody and everybody to run those worship centers, and he led the people of Israel in a tremendous abomination against God into idolatry. Nearly 58 years have passed from Israel at the top of their game, where Solomon, with all of his wisdom, with all of the blessing that God had brought on him, 58 years, and there enters into the stage now after the sin of Jeroboam, somebody who is the MVP 
the greatest of being the worst, a man by the name of Ahab. We read about Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 16 last week. Ahab, according to the Scripture, in verse 30, look at that, would you please? 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 30. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. There was nobody like him. Verse 33, and Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. We consider the times uh, that Elijah lived in. Elijah watched as the people, his people, the people of God, were turning away from God and raising up altars to Baal and a goddess by the name of Ashtaroth. Under the worship of Baal and under the worship of Ashtaroth, this would lead them into licentious living, uh, sexual immorality, violence, greed. A, a rotten time is where Elijah finds himself. As if it was a light thing. Not only did Ahab worship Baal, false gods, but Ahab took to be his wife someone by the name of Jezebel. Jezebel was not of Israel. Jezebel was the daughter of one of the wicked kings that surrounded Israel. And she led uh, 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 this, her husband, and also the people into the worship of Baal. And Ahab, who was uh, the worst, now marries the worst. And Ahab and Jezebel sit on a throne, and they're leading the northern portion of Israel into apostasy such as they had not ever known. In a mountain range called Gilead, there's a man by the name of Elijah. He's called Elijah the Tishbite. That's the group that he was associated with. Elijah's heart is being stirred. He's hearing and he's looking and he's seeing what's becoming of his country, what's becoming of the people of God. And he begins to pray that God would do something. In the book of James, James chapter 5, his testimony is given, and we considered that last week. Not only did he pray that it would rain, but according to that passage, he prayed that it wouldn't rain. I see in my mind's eye Elijah as he's walking and pacing back and forth, perplexed and vexed by what's becoming of his nation, what's becoming of his people, a people who had had such a tremendous relationship with the living God, the living God that had promised them such things, the living God that had delivered them from Egypt in such a powerful way, the living God that had brought them into the promised land, that living God that had tabernacled with them. His heart is breaking for his people, and he's praying that God would do something, that God would get their attention. God had promised Israel that not only would he bring them into the land, but in several passages, and we considered those last week, he also said that in the land he would provide the rain that they needed. He would give them the latter and the former rain. He would give them in the fall what was required, in the spring season, the planting season, and in the harvest season. And God said, you will know by the dew and by the rain that I'm blessing and I'm meeting your needs. And so when Elijah began to pray that the rain would be held back, that was direct judgment. That was something that the people would recognize that came from the hand of God. It's also that Baal and Ashtaroth, these gods that were no gods, these false gods, they were also credited with the harvest. They were also credited with rain. And I believe that Elijah wanted God to be known by his people in such a simple way. And how do you get people's attention? In simple ways. For example, we're cruising through life and everything seems fine until we don't have our health. How often do we take our health for granted? We're cruising through life and everything seems fine until oftentimes it's little things that derail us or set us aside for a while and they cause us to remember and to consider what God has done. Elijah wanted the rain dried up and so he was told by God to go and to proclaim that to this King Ahab. Last Sunday morning, we put some time into the verse in chapter 16 and verse 34 that there was a man who did something else. He rebuilt the city of Jericho. And we talked about that city of Jericho and the curse that was upon him and that man raising those walls and the significance of that being that Jericho, that first city that God had forced the walls down, and now this man would seek to go completely against what God had done, completely against the victory that God had brought them in Jericho and rebuild that city that city that had meant so much and spoke so poorly of the living God that God would destroy it. And we talked on that, about that last week and the fullness of that land and the fullness of sin there and how God dealt with them. Elijah steps on the scene. Elijah, the man from Gilead, the Tishbite, and he comes to King Ahab in verse 1 of chapter 17 and says that for three years uh, there'll be no rain, there'll be no dew. The water spigot is turned off. 
That'll affect their crops. That'll affect their daily life. And so we come oftentimes to the story of Elijah on the top of Mount Carmel where they're having that contest. But you understand that leading up to that was the time that God was getting the people prepared for that contest that would take place on Mount Carmel. There was going to be a proving to the people of who the living and true God is. We spoke last week of the desire that we should have that those that are around us would know the living and true God. We communicated that we should be praying for our young people that they would know the living and true God. We likened it in some ways to even our society today, a society that is adrift, a culture that is in a crisis because I believe we've turned our backs on the Word of God and on the living God. And when you stop believing in the living God and when you stop believing in the Word of the living God, then you open yourself up to believing in anything and everything. And we are today adrift. We're a mess. That's easy to see and easy to say. And we debate and we have to legislate now such things that shouldn't even be discussed. Such things that children shouldn't even hear of. We're now arguing whether or not they should be taught in the kindergarten in the first grade. I can only wonder what our founding fathers would think of the freedom that they fought and gave their lives that we would be able to enjoy, that we would be able to worship the living and true God. It's not our founding fathers' desires to keep God out of government. It was their desire to keep government out of God. They weren't not wanting God to be remembered. God is all over everything. By the way, today our nation as other nations are hated because of our Judeo-Christian values and our heritage and our history. The enemy seeks to destroy our heritage and our history. And it's not so much personal to us as much as it is to this. The Word of God and the truth of God. And Elijah had a strong burden for his people. He wanted them to know God. He wanted them to know the living God, the one true God, the God of Israel. And so Elijah prayed, and God sent him to Ahab, and he faced Ahab, Ahab that king who had done more, according to the first Kings 16, to provoke God than any other king. And he is given the announcement, there'll be no rain. Immediately God, and then last Sunday evening we went and we saw that immediately God would take Elijah and tell him to go to the brook Cherith, which was east of Jordan, there at the brook Cherith, and that word Cherith means cutting. Somewhat like a ravine, like a natural landfall where water perhaps would come down from a mountain or the overflow of a river would find its way through this and it would be a creek that would run and in season would run high and full. And then at other times it would dry up. It was receiving water from another source. And there's a tremendous picture in that. You will see that Elijah will be there for some time and God provides for him. God sends ravens. There are several things that take place in 1 Kings 17 that Elijah, as a Jewish man, would have had a problem with. First, he would have had a problem with a raven because a raven was a dirty bird. It was a bird that would go and pick the animals uh, that had been uh, the roadkill. A chariot maybe ran over something. How many have ever seen a turkey buzzard up close? Are they creepy or what, huh? And they are picking and pulling at that dead critter on the side of the road. The raven was much like that as well. And uh, I don't know that I'd ever seen a turkey buzzard until I'd moved to Greenwood. I think the smog up in northwest Indiana was too much to keep them away. But now that I've seen one, man, it's just the craziest thing I've ever seen. And they're nasty. And they're eating things that are rotten. God used a raven to provide for Elijah. And he gave him morning and evening bread and meat. God met his needs. In the brook called Cherith, he was in hiding. While he's in hiding, Ahab is furious. He's furious. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 10, I want you to see this. Jump ahead with me real quick, would you please? 1 Kings 18 and verse 10 is the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord, this is Ahab, whither my Lord Ahab hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said, He is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And so while Elijah is at that brook Cherith, and he, every day the ravens are coming and they're bringing him meat and bread, and he's drinking of that brook, the rain and the dew have ceased. And maybe on that first week that Ahab went out and he noticed that the dew was not there that he was accustomed to. 
Now, perhaps they were beginning to travel through seasons where there was the expectation of rain, and the rain was not there. Ahab began to get nervous. I don't know when it happened, but at some point Ahab said, go and find that guy. Later on, when Ahab will confront Elijah, he will say of Elijah that he was the one who troubled Israel. He said, find him. And they sent folks out to every country and every nation, and they asked, hey, is this guy here? And they gave a description of this guy, Elijah. He stood out by the way he presented himself and the way he carried himself. Is he here? When folks would say he's not here, then Ahab would say, swear to it. Swear to me that he's not here. Because in the event he is and I find out, we're going to have a problem. Today in the Middle East, there are nations who harbor terrorists. They allow them to come in across their borders and hide and perform their activities, their terrorist activities. And some of the hubbub and to-do there is what to do with those nations who would say, we're not hurting anybody, but we're harboring those that do. Nahab's perspective was that it was Elijah who was causing the problems. It wasn't Elijah, was it? It was Ahab and Jezebel that had caused the problems. They were looking for him. And so God took Elijah to a brook, a place that's called Cherith, but also we know in the Hebrew word it's the word cutting. And last Sunday evening we considered that place where the Lord was dealing with him. Five times in the chapter 17 of 1 Kings you'll see something that alludes to the word of the Lord. You'll see the word of the Lord told Elijah to do something. You'll see where Elijah proclaims the word of the Lord. You see, we're going to come to a portion of Scripture that is one of my favorite. It's when Elijah will stand up on the top of Mount Carmel and he'll have a contest against the false prophets of Baal. But building up to that, God is developing and God is working in Elijah's life. God takes him to a place of cutting. God takes him to a place to see that God can provide for him and that God can protect him. And you and I now, as we look back on this story, we see exactly why God would take him to a brook where nobody was at, because he is being hunted now. The brook dries up. We closed with that last Sunday evening. There are times in our lives when the brook dries up and God is stirring us and moving us on. The Bible then, as we read a moment ago in 1 Kings chapter 17, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, that's significant to us. That's a city in a country. And that city and that country are about 100 miles away from where Elijah is at. In order to get there, he's going to have to travel across tough terrain, dry terrain to get there. A land that is going without rain and dew. And now God is calling Elijah on a difficult journey. Not only is he taking him on a difficult journey, but he's taking him to a place that you and I would say is the least likely place the prophet of God should go. He is going to the country of Jezebel, where her father, the king, rules, where the people worship Baal. He is going to a town, the town called Zarephath. The name Zarephath in Hebrew means the refining place. It was later changed to the smelting place, probably a place that was known for industry there where metals were refined. And you know when they take silver and they find it or gold in the ground, they take it and they put it through a process. And that process is heating it up and melting it and drawing the dross or drawing out of it the things that are not good. That's the refining process. First Peter says to us that the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. You see, the refining is what Elijah will need. Elijah called now by God to go someplace on a great journey at a great distance through a dry land and to come now and to be cared for by someone. Remember, the ravens would have been a problem for him as a Jewish man to have a dirty bird feed him. There were rules and laws about touching those things that were dead, and yet that's how God chose to care for him. Look at verse 9. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, look at this. I have commanded a what? A widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, I don't know that it has the connotation to us that it would have had to Elijah. But I don't have much use for a person that would take advantage of a widow. I don't have much use for a person that would take advantage of an older person. We had in our church years ago a fine man who as he got on up in years, somebody through a telephone scam began to scam him. They knew of his military service and they knew how to use that against him and they began to scam him out of money. Tens of thousands of dollars. 
So that at the end of his life, a man who had lived a very recognizable, notable life found himself broke because of somebody who was scamming him. If I could have gotten my hands around the person that was scamming him, you might not have a pastor today. I was furious to find out about this and furious to find out that these people weren't necessarily even operating inside our country. What kind of person would do that to take advantage of someone that way? You'll notice in Israel, one of the histories and one of the trends that they had when God was judging them is that they were not treating those who were in need correctly. They were taking advantage. And God had an issue with that. In Exodus chapter 22, God even gave specific instructions. Exodus 22, 22 through 24, those verses of how people were not to take advantage of the widow or take advantage of the orphan. Now hold on a second. Elijah, a man's man, we talked about Elijah. We talked about how he came in the spirit of Elijah. And as you looked at him, he looked like a mountain man coming down from Gilead, a rough and tough spot. Naturally speaking, if you were told to go on a long journey and then that you were going to be cared for by a what? A widow? A widow? Culturally speaking, that was somebody who had nothing. She would be the one who should receive from him, not him from her. But you see, God was doing something. In this business of being refined, it is important for us to see that there are things and areas of our life where God would bring us that require patience. Patience. Patience to make that long journey. Patience to see what God is doing. Patience to wait on the Lord. So, Elijah does exactly what the Lord tells him to do. He heads in that direction. Verse 10, he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city... Behold, the widow woman, the widow woman, the one that God was going to use, was there gathering of sticks. Why was she gathering of sticks? Because she had no resources to purchase those things by which she could have a fire. She was outside the city because she was destitute. I've seen those pictures before of people who find themselves in difficult places, at times war-torn or perhaps in lands uh, where it's complicated even in building a fire. I've seen even pictures here in America for folks who lived in the big cities back when there was times of depression and they wanted to have a fire to warm their home in the midst of winter and they took furniture and they chopped furniture up to be able to have a fire, to be able to have warm. We're a spoiled generation. We don't know what tough times are. This widow was experiencing tough times and she's outside of the gate and she's gathering sticks to build a fire when Elijah sees her in a very gentlemanly, uh, I believe, appropriate way, he asks her for a drink of water. This is not the first time we've seen something like this. When Abraham sent his servant to get a bride for his son Isaac, the servant didn't know how to find out who it was that would be that bride. And so he approached also an area, and he saw a young lady there, and he asked for water. And not only did she give him water, but she watered his camels as well. And he knew then that this would be the bride for Isaac. Perhaps for that in his mind, he set out, and he asked for water. I pray thee, fetch thee some water. And he went from that, and look at verse 11. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. She was going to get the water. And now he asked for a morsel, morsel of bread. Uh, maybe one would look at that and say he's pushing it. But he asks. Now I want you to hear her response, please. Verse 12, and she, this is the widow, the widow who's so poor and without, she's outside the gate looking for sticks to build a fire. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth. See that word thy? What is she saying? Your God, whoever it is that your God, whoever you stand in front of, thy God liveth. I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, and that we may eat it and what? Die. Anybody here ever said, I don't have two sticks to rub, to, two pennies to rub together? Ever felt that way before? That's how she felt. I've got two sticks, and I'm getting ready to do something, sir. I don't know, in the presence of your God, let me tell you what my life looks like. I've got these two sticks that I've gathered. I'm going to go home. I'm going to make what I can, and my son and I are going to die. Hold on. That gal needed Elijah 
as much as he needed her. You ever stop to think that God brought Elijah there to her to hide him and to provide for him, but also in doing that, that widow was cared for. We'll see later on in the story in an even greater way. Hold on. Elijah, God has called you to a difficult place. Uh, uh, not seemingly the right place. God has called you to go and to have a widow care for you. Not just any widow, a broke, poor, impoverished widow who isn't just running on fumes. The gauge is at the E and the light is flashing. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You ever drive and you see that you're close to E and think, ah, I get a little further. And then you get down to that mark. I'm almost there. And then the light begins to flash. And what that, what that light is saying is, hey, you big dummy, what's it going to take to get you to stop and get gas, right? Oh, I think I can make it. How many have ever ended up on the side of the road saying to yourself, I thought I could make it? The last time I did that, I almost made it in, right? She's running on fumes. She's running on empty. I don't blame her. Here's a stranger that's come to her. She doesn't necessarily know all that's happening. It's just that he's asked for water and he's asked for bread. Sir, don't have it to give to you. Now I want you to see here. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Oh, I love those two words. I hear the voice of the angels as they say what? Fear not. I hear the voice of the resurrected Savior as he says what? Fear not. I see it in the book of Revelation where the Lord Jesus says to John, Fear not. The enemy brings confusion and the enemy brings fear. You see, when there's fear, there is a fight against faith. Everybody here has things that stir us. Everybody here has things that cause us to be fearful. When we were children, we were afraid of things that were silly and things that weren't even necessarily reality. But as we get older and we live a little, we recognize things that cause real fear to us. We go and we visit those who are infirmed or we visit those who are in a difficult place and it becomes our fear then that someday I would end up with that situation. When we're young and dumb, we expect that everything will work out pretty good. And then we live long enough to see that not always do things work out the way we expected them to. There is always an occasion for fear. But there's something that God wants us to have in our connection and our relationship to Him. And that is God does not want us to be fearful in that sense. Oh, that's not to say we're not to be in awe of God or to fear the person or the position of God. But let me tell you something. God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, we are now at what? We're at peace with God. I have good standing in my relationship with God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I understand who I am, why I am. I understand where I'm going, and I understand how I'm getting there. I don't understand everything about here and there, and I don't understand everything about there, but I know enough to know I don't need to be afraid of those things. Fear not. While you're living today, maybe even in a time where fear, fear sells, stirring people up and causing people to be afraid because fearful people will sometimes make poor decisions. Fear for people will sometimes give up things that belong to them in order to not be afraid. Sometimes fearful people will put their hope in things that aren't real. Elijah says to her, fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus, 14, saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Elijah said, ma'am, go and do what you said. You said you were going to go and make that meal. You go and do that. But I want you to mix up your order a little bit. I want you to make mine first. Now, why in the world would Elijah get his first? Because Elijah was so much more important than her son and so much more important than the widow? No, because Elijah represented something. Elijah represented the word of God. Elijah represented the things of God. And what was being taught here was that even in the midst of testing, even in the midst of refining, we've got to have the right priorities. We've got to put God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee. We say, preacher, we're living in times of turmoil. We're living in times of crisis. I'm afraid. Listen, 
Seek him. Seek his will. Seek his way. Give him his priority. Put God first. Put God in the middle. However you like to describe that to me, it's not a list of priorities or of importance. God is the list. And when I love him as I should, and when I'm obeying him as I should, that will align all relationships and directives in life when God gets his place in my life. And allow him to have that. Feed me, and God will care for you. Now notice the pattern. Elijah had been told by God, go to the brook. He got up, he went, and he did that. God said, go to Zarephath, a complicated place with a, in a, a strange predicament of a poor widow. But he got up and he did that. Before you and I can direct other people to follow the word of God, we need to learn to obey the word of God. One of the problems that we have generationally is we've done a really good job in telling people what to do and not showing them that practice in our own life. Hey, obey God. Go and make that meal, make mine, and there'll be plenty for you and your son. But you know, a long time before Elijah told her that, he himself had followed the directives of God. He had learned that principle that we see in the book of Corinthians, that it's the God of all comforts who comforts us so that we in turn can do what? Comfort others. Elijah knew that God could take care of her because Elijah had seen God take care of him. You see the place of refining, Zarephath, calls to us and speaks to us of several things. First, it speaks to us of patience. And let patience have her perfect work, waiting on God. You see, the refining that takes place in 1 Kings 17 in Elijah's life and in the widow's life is a refining that establishes the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Patience. We, say, we recognize and see God's purpose. Why would Elijah be sent to the house of a widow and a poor widow at that? Who would be looking for him there? What context would she have? She was outside the city. She had nobody. What a perfect place, providentially speaking, for God to put Elijah. Then in a place perhaps no one would be looking for him and in a home where nobody would even know he was there. You don't always understand God's purposes, nor do I. But as we trust him and we look back, we can see the providence of God, his care, his directive in our life to refine us, to develop us, to make us exactly who he needs us to be and wants us to be to fulfill his purposes. I was teaching this week on the life of Fanny Crosby, talking about how she was blinded as a child unnecessarily. She was not born blind. And the illness led to that, and someone practiced medicine on her that should not have even done so. And a patch, a mustard plaster put on her eyes, took her blindness. It was never brought back. Later on in life, to this effect, she said that even if she could, even if she could, she would not undo that because it was because of the blindness, because of that suffering, that God did such a work in her heart and in her soul that you and I are blessed by every time we sing, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Written where? Written in the heart of a little gal who went through purposes that her mother and her grandmother wept over and tried to do all they could for her, but then were resolved that even in that, they would implant in her heart the Word of God. And now, all these years later, thousands and thousands of songs written that you and I will stand and sing and be helped by came through the purpose that God took her through. Camps that have been founded and established because of men who and women who have lost children that they loved in tragic situations. Pastors, evangelists, missionaries, teachers who've been formed in the furnace of affliction and suffering to have a heart and a tenderness and a kindness People who've dealt with physical abuse and mental complications and struggles in life so that they could be secured or be helped by Jesus so that they could in return come to others and say, hey, let me help you as Jesus has helped me. These are the purposes. We don't always get them. Why Zarephath? Why Zidon? Why a poor widow? God says, I'm refining. I'm doing a work here. I've got something going on here. You don't always get it. You don't always see it, but you need to trust me and you need to know it. And there he is in the place of refining. There he finds this lady in a predicament. What had he not, what if he had not come? What if he had not been through that process of being refined? 
Her predicament was what? That she would die. You know the world today is in a predicament? The people that you work alongside of, the people that you live next door to, they're in a predicament. It's called the sin predicament. And without the gospel, without the good news of Jesus Christ, without an understanding of the death, burial, and resurrection, and faith being placed in Christ, this world and the people in this world are in such a predicament, they're lost and dying and on their way to a devil's hell. And you and I, as we go through life and we experience the Lord's refining process, He brings our path across their path that we can help them. We notice also in this place of refining is the Word of God is being established, that the Word of God is being developed in Elijah's heart and now in this widow's heart, that what God says He will do, that what God's promises are, they come to pass, that God is able. I'm reminded of that statement in the book of Genesis, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Elijah was cared for in a humbling way by ravens. Elijah was cared for in a humbling way by a poor widow. The widow was blessed. And so she did. She obeyed as Elijah had patterned obedience to the word of the Lord. She did as well. Look at verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. God said, I'll provide. By the way, God didn't give her a new barrel. God didn't give her a new cruise. God used the one that she had. There is a lad here that has some loaves and fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, bring them to me and I'll show you. You say, I'm just an old vessel. I'm about empty. I'm about out of oil. What can the Lord do? The Lord can use you. Notice how the Lord cared for them. The barrel didn't <laughs> begin to overflow. The cruise, the vessel that would hold oil, oil that would be used to cook with, to provide the meal, that cruise didn't begin to pour over. Just as God had done for Elijah, morning and evening, God will do for them. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he in her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to what? According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. She went at the word of Elijah. Elijah said to do it, and I'll do it. Hey, quite honestly, what, what else did she have to lose? So she went and did it. And that first time she went thinking that there was just enough. Remember, she said, we're going to die. She went in, and there was enough meal, and there was enough oil. She fed Elijah. She fed the son. She fed, fed herself. The next time it came to eat again, she went over there to that bucket where the meal was kept, and she looked in there, and there was enough to make Elijah, to make hers, and to make the sons. And then she went the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And the Lord taught her, and now we learn through that, that pattern that we're given in the book of Corinthians, that our life is to be lived, how? Day by day. Day by day. God put Israel through that when he gave them manna. God sent bread down from heaven, angels' food. God sent it down to feed them, and God said, you gather enough for the day. Leading up to the Sabbath, you take enough for two days, but don't hoard it and don't take too much, because if you do, it'll turn into what? It'll rot instantly. It'll have worms in it. And true to form, that first time the manna came down, what did some people of Israel do? They went out and grabbed as much as they could. And they brought it in and they stored it, and just as God said it would, it rotted on them. And God was teaching them a lesson. It's the same lesson that he's trying to teach us, and that is day by day. How are we living this life? Day by day. Oh, I prepare for tomorrow by good stewardship today, but the reality is I don't know what tomorrow brings any more than you do. And if you live your life constantly remembering and considering what you have done, or if you're always looking forward to what you're going to do, then you miss out on where you're at. 
Well, years ago I prayed. Years ago I walked with God. Years ago God used me. Or consider the Apostle Paul as he said, hey, I'm forgetting those things which are in the past and I'm pressing toward the mark. I don't think he was just forgetting wrongdoing or those times when he was in violation of Christ and working against Christ. I think he was talking about past victories as well. Because there are some times when we look back on what, who, we, we, who we were and what we've become and we're satisfied. But if you and I are going to grow, if you and I are going to continue to develop until the Lord calls us home, then just as that barrel got meal every day and just like that cruise got oil every day, then there needs to be in us that coming to the Lord on a daily basis, looking to him and saying, God, I'm in the refining process of life. I need from you today at your hand provision. I need today at your hand direction. I need wisdom. I need the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, the oil for life and for living. God, help me today. So oftentimes we become like those in the Scripture who are settled on their lees. We go as far as we're going to go, we grow as much as we're going to grow, and then we just sit. And we become stagnant. But a barrel that is in constant need of supply, a cruise that is in constant need of supply, getting from the provider what is required for the day. Do you suspect that every time she got that there, I would have to think that every time she went to the barrel, she would look. There's enough for today. Thank you, God of Elijah. Hey, Elijah might have said, was there enough oil for today? Yeah, just like I said. And I think in the Hebrew they were either making buttermilk biscuits or pancakes. Could have been one or the other, all right, depending on where you're from. And every day and every time they'd come back, you imagine when Elijah would look at that and say, okay, thank you, Lord, another day. And you know what? Isn't that really the reality of things? We're living day by day, trusting the Lord each and every day. This walk. So Elijah gone to a refining place. Patience. God's purpose is unfolded. The predicament of those that were around him. And then I want you to see the provision that God had. A day by day provision. And this gal had her priority. She put the request, the direction of the Lord first. Priority right. Plenty of provision. This evening we'll come back together. We will see how the worst thing, I believe, to the widow could happen in her mind, in her perspective. God has met her needs thus far, and God will continue to meet her needs. Are you today in a refining place? Do you find your day to yourself today in a place that requires extra patience? Do you find yourself today looking for the purpose? Do you see sometimes a need for a restructuring of our priorities? Maybe it's today provision, trust in the Lord. The world is stirred up right now. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, huh? Some trust in the GOP, some trust in the, di moving on. Some people are trusting in all sorts of things, but where they need to be trusting is where? In the Lord. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father in heaven, thank you for this time we could spend in the Word of God. Lord, to be directed in that. Lord, help us now as we consider Elijah. We consider this refining in his life. Patience. Uh, Lord, your purpose. Lord, priorities. Lord, to recognize what you're doing. To trust you. Lord, also then in your provision. Lord, may we not grow stagnant. May we come to that barrel each and every day looking for that day's supply. Looking to you, trusting you, rejoicing in each and every day, Lord, that which you'd accomplish. Lord, help us to live in that fashion. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Who's here this morning? You say, preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I don't know for sure if I were to die today that heaven would be my home. I have questions about that. I have Concerns. I don't know that. I don't know that I'm saved. Last week we had a couple of folks raise their hand and we were able to communicate with them the gospel. And we'd love to do the same with you today. Maybe you don't know those things. You don't know that you have eternal life. You say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure if I were to die today that heaven would be my home, that I would be in the presence of the Lord. And you'd say, Preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved. Who would say that? Preacher, please pray for me. Would you lift your hand that I might pray for you? I see your hand. I see your hand. 
Who else this morning would say that today? Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I'd like to know that. Several folks have raised their hand this morning, whether you did or you didn't. If you don't know the answer to that question, the most important question, most important thing, like that fellow cried out in the book of Acts, what must I do to be saved? How do I have peace with God? The Bible says that we have peace with God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'd like for you to know that today. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm saved, but there is in my life a refining process. There is a time that's requiring patience, and there are, there's stuff going on in my life that I believe the Lord is just really trying to bring me through and make me finer for it, testing my faith. And you'd say, Pastor, please pray for me. That's where I find myself today. Would you lift your hand? Anybody like that today? Say, Preacher, there was something in that message and that topic for me today. See your hands. Wonderful. Trust, Lord, that you'll do a work in our heart, Lord, that we would yield to you, that we would recognize as the prophet of old, thou art the potter and we are the clay. Lord, might we allow you to make us and mold us and shape us after your will. Lord, if there are those today that are lost, may they today come and trust Christ as their Savior. We'll rejoice in that, Lord, with them. Could we stand to our feet, please? Our heads are bowed. We're not looking around. We have a few moments here for invitation. You've listened to the Word of God now. We're designed the Lord would work in our hearts and bring us to decision to that point. If you this morning raised your hand or did not, but you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you'd like to know for sure that you're saved and on your way to heaven, there are men and there are ladies who would love to talk to you and answer questions and to guide you in the Scripture that you might be able to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I encourage you to join others that have already left their seat. And I encourage you to come forward today and let folks help you with that. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm saved, but there is a Lord stirring and developing in my heart directive in this matter of the refining process of life. Why don't you use the altar today? Maybe it's to come today and just trust the Lord. Maybe you don't get what he's doing or why he's doing it. Why a raven? Why a widow? God's working. Let's yield to him. Let's trust him. Can we? You come now. If you raised your hand a moment ago and you said, Preacher, there's a need in my life, you come and join others that have come forward today. Let's do business with the Lord this morning. Can we please? The pianist is playing.